All right, folks, I'm still setting a couple things up on my end, but maybe you can let me know if you can hear me okay. That would be awesome. I don't live stream enough to be good at it, unfortunately. Um, let's see. People hearing me okay? A couple people say it sounds good. Awesome. So if you're jumping on, uh, just kind of hang in there while I uh, kind of silly, silly just look at these monitors here and glance back and forth and make sure I've got everything as dialed as I can. Let's see, let's pull this over here. Awesome. Sounds like I sound okay. Excellent. You guys can maybe say hi to each other. Thanks for saying hi to me. I'll say hi to you here in a second more formally, but I'm just trying to get one last little thing to work here. Um, Let's try this. Okay. Trying to figure out how to move my little headshot down to the bottom right. If anyone has any awesome ideas, that would be cool. I've got an outline there of some, some of the things we'll be doing today in our live stream. So hopefully those look like things that get you pretty motivated and excited. Um, looking forward to uh, helping with any questions you guys might have or what little bit of discussion we can do on this platform and with this format. Maybe if I just pull it down to the bottom, maybe that's the trick. Maybe, maybe not. All right, so we got video, we got audio. Those are all good things to start a live stream with. It's about, we got about nine minutes to go. I'll start uh, giving some folks a shout out. I'm sure you can see each other on the live chat. We already have 157 folks, which is really awesome. And let's see. So, yeah, I'll just go through. Um, well, I can't say everyone's name. That's too many. But I'll just scroll through. Uh, if people said where they're from, that's always cool. Mary from Maryland. That's perfect. Wow. I could be Wilsey from Wilseyland if such a place existed. Mr. Still Racing from Medina, Ohio. Um Let's see. Doo, doo, doo. Andy from Iceland. Thank you. Awesome. And my good friend, Amanda Joe, uh, one of our dear Icelanders who is a resident of Grindavik. So awesome. Glad she has time to get on. Uh, Pookie Dust from England. Very nice. Uh, Kate from Cambridgeshire, UK. Excellent. Uh, Kate Mancu from Lodgepole, Alberta. Uh, Northern Last from Texas. Howdy. Diana from the UK. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Jeffrey from the Tug Hill Plateau of New York State. I have no idea where that is, but I'd love to find out. Uh, in surreal time in sunny SoCal. Yeah, it's a uh, weather forecast here in Southern Idaho. It's not foggy, like socked in fog, but like it just looks ominously overcast. So we've got some inversion here um, and probably 
Oh, Fahrenheit, it's probably like 40, 35 degrees outside. So not awesome, but we'll take it. I like, I actually like winter. I don't have a problem with winter. Marilyn from Mount Diablo in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, Liz, I am not using OBS Studio this time. I played with it. I need to switch. I need, I would like to move to that permanently. Uh, so I'm using Zoom for this one just because that's what I was most familiar with. So even though my little head's up in the right corner, I don't think that is a deal breaker. I think we'll be okay. But yeah, so it is, I'm, I'm using Zoom this time, but I do want to use OBS Studio, which I've been playing with. Uh, Lloyd from the UK, Greg in Eastern Tennessee. Hello, my friend. Uh, Amanda from Hampshire, UK. Angela of Montana. Deborah wants to know if I'll autograph my book if she brings it to CSI. Heck yeah, let me know. Um, I'm in most of this week and next. So Deborah, if you want to bring your book in, I'd be happy to autograph that for you. Haley from the UK. Andy, yeah, from Iceland. I think I mentioned him. Erica from Sweden. Neil from Inverness, Scotland. Scotland's amazing. Virgil from Billings, Montana. Peter from SoCal. Dan Cooper from Pittsburgh. Marsha from Utah. Hello, Marsha. David from Ottawa, Canada. Um, this is great. River Guy 33 from New Jersey. Belinda from Oregon. Hardnack Farms from Oklahoma. Venture Off Road from Vancouver. 07 from Chicago. Eric from Marion, Virginia. Uh, Ember from Michigan. Marley Willow from Texas. Boy, this is great. Now we're up to 240. Oh my gosh. Now I'm like starting to panic. It's it's uh, more people than I'm used to. So I'll try to get through all these. If I miss you, I super apologize. Leanne from Florida. John from Colorado. Harmony from Eugene, Oregon. Kay from Fredericksburg, Texas. Uh, M. Hans Liebert, Outwash Plain of South Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Marcus from Sweden. Uh, I think it's Lise Lot from Denmark, Corey from Arizona, awesome, Lou from Nampa, living in Virginia Beach, Susie from Boise, uh, someone in the Himalayas, that's pretty cool, wow, um, GS, Diana from South UK, Anaconda, Montana, that's Charles, Bremerton, Washington, that's Sunny, Skagged Ed, hello, he's from Washington, I believe, uh, ATC from the Netherlands, Shauna from Sydney, Australia, down under. Good day. Uh, Laura from San Antonio, Dan from Boise, Tricky from Oslo, Lloyd. Oh, let's see. Da, 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 da. People talking to each other. Baron from Germany, Andrea from Edinburgh, Scotland. Oh, I've been there. That place is great. Um, David from El Paso, Barry from Manchester, Hazel from Belfast, Steffi from Germany. Marina from Sweden, JJ from Ashland, Oregon. Oh boy. Um, let's see. Mom from Atlantic Canada. I don't know. Is this boring or is this exciting? I I'm excited reading all the names and hearing where you're from. So if if you're bored, hang in there for a couple minutes. And if you're excited like me, then continue to be excited. Uh oh, Skagit, Burlington, Washington. Yes, we got that correct. Uh, Marcus. Uh, let's see, Skig, Stigbeater from Yorkshire in the UK, Kyle from Virginia, yeah, Shauna, it's a nice hot one down there in Sydney, it sounds like, Allison from Boston, some of you folks saying hello to each other, Mark from Kent in the UK, very nice, Tony from Raleigh, Jürgen from Germany, Judy Bug from Alberta, Canada, um okay this is great um if i missed you i apologize a couple more though and hopefully i'll catch up soon uh salome arizona tom lots of zent nerds here yeah i've got a little announcement about for you zent nerds that might make you happy uh todd from indiana grind from iceland from live from iceland great some of my friends from live from iceland are here excellent howard from atlanta georgia renee from montana Portugal, Michael, Bethany from the UK, Karen from Nashville, Ed from San Jose, uh, good day from Adelaide, Australia. Excellent. Sandra from Somerset, John from, John's 100% Northern European. Good to know. Uh, Nancy, Missoula, Montana. And we're almost there, team, in terms of time-wise. Um, 
hopefully I got most of you. Cincinnati, Ohio, Florida. Joe from Snowdonia, North Wales. Brian E. from Vancouver. Awesome, awesome, awesome. As good from Dresden, Germany. David from SoCal. Paul from Austria. Half a mile from the San Andreas Fault. I was just down there, Edward. Uh, I've got some videos on that coming out soon. Gene from Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, I'd, I would love the geology in the Flinders Range. I'd, I'd like to get down there. Erica from Goth, Gothenburg. Hazel from Northern Ireland. Kathy from Wisconsin. Barry from Minneapolis. I'm almost caught up. Uh, hello from Boulder. Lynn's from Scotland. Okay. Awesome. Steffi from Germany. Southeast England. Hello from Norway. Wow, we're really covering the globe here, team. That's great. Um, it's just really humbling. So, so awesome. Here I am in Podunk, little town, Twin Falls, Idaho, and I'm able to connect with so many, so many folks from so many places, and we're all united with the theme of geology and learning and understanding Earth's amazing landscapes and processes. I think that's just that's that's why we're here. That's exceptional. Um, so we will go ahead and get started. It is pretty much uh, right on the hour on my clock. And so the plan for today, and thanks for joining me. I, I want to welcome all the new subscribers and new viewers. Over the last month, um, my little YouTube side gig project channel thing has really taken off. It demanded a lot more time out of me, but it's been really rewarding. It's been a tremendous joy to bring all these places and stories to you. Uh, it's my passion. And I've learned a lot, not just in researching places on my own, but I've learned a lot from my viewers. So I want to thank you all for the perspectives you provide, for the um, insights you provide. And since it's sort of that holiday time of year where we're where we think about our what we're grateful for and our gratitude, I just want to say uh, publicly how grateful I am for all of you for allowing me to have this platform in this avenue to share my passion with so many people. Um, I was happy before sharing geology with, you know, a couple dozen students every semester, and to be able now to take this to another level level and engage with so many people on a global platform is just really awesome. So as much as you're enjoying whatever I'm doing, just know that I'm also enjoying the process of making the videos and I'm enjoying the interaction and getting to know you as best I can through through these means. So anyway, um, okay, so my plan for today is pretty pretty loosey goosey, pretty informal. We'll I've got some some slides I want to show you, some of the places I've been over this last few months, I suppose. Uh, announcements of a couple of field trips I'm noodling and, and putting together. I don't have any hard dates on those yet, but I at least have like months and themes picked out, at least in a preliminary way. I'll probably have more details as we roll into the next year. Uh, we'll do an update on the situation in Iceland. I looked at some of the data this morning, and my good friend over there, Amanda Jo, you know, is always good at providing me some of the latest news and information that's going on in that portion of the world. And then we'll end with some Q&A. And we're up to about three, almost 350 people. I will try my darndest to... Um, give you my attention. If you would like a question to be answered, uh, try to put it in bold caps locks. I know that looks obnoxious, um, but it helps get my attention. Or I think the other way to do it is if you put the at symbol and then my name, I, I believe it'll show up uh, highlighted on the live chat feed and that'll catch my attention as well. Otherwise, you guys are fine to um, chat with each other, get to know each other and communicate that way as well. So Appreciate your time. So as many of you know, um, and I haven't done a live stream since my last one was November 8th. And in the last month or so, things have really blown up because of all the Iceland information. And I didn't really expect that. I didn't know that, you know, I was going to geek out and look at all the Iceland stuff because it's a place near and dear to my heart. And I thought some of the things happening were interesting from a scientific point of view, but then it became more of a much bigger public human news story when we had the earthquakes near in Gurindavik and they had to evacuate the town, which is still an ongoing issue. So if the Iceland thing's gone off your radar and you think it's back to normal there, 
Um, just know that that's not true. Uh, people like Amanda Joe and others probably won't be able to spend the holidays, at least overnight, and we'll get to that later, in their homes in, in Grindavik. But, um, but one of the positives that came out of that, I suppose, if there is a silver lining, was that it brought a lot of people to me that probably didn't know that I existed. And so the updates I was providing really resonated with a lot of people around the world. And I appreciate that because I was just giving it my typical scientific take of like, hey, here's what we know, here's the data, and then here's here's my take on it. Here's my analysis. Here's my perspective as a geologist uh, and someone who's trying to learn and understand this just like you. And so somehow that really resonated with a lot of people, especially when we live in an age of so much sensationalism uh, out there amongst all the media options that we have. Um, so it really brought a lot of people to the channel, which is great. That's probably why I have so many of you here today. Uh, but some of you have been with me since the beginning, and this started out as a very small project for me right after, right when COVID, the COVID pandemic descended upon us all. I started making these videos as a way to bring geology to my students since I couldn't meet with them. But what I found in the course of doing so is that it brought brought to me like this global audience of people who were interested in geology and what I was doing. So that's great. Um, okay, so let's start here. And if you were on some of my live streams earlier this year, uh, the college granted me a sabbatical this semester and they allowed me to travel around the West and take a semester off from teaching and basically travel to places either I hadn't made videos at or maybe I hadn't been to at all and put together different videos that I could use, not just with my students, but that could go out to people like you in the global community on the YouTube platform and um, as, as a way of just public education. So I'm really appreciative to the college for supporting this project and this effort. And so this was the map I presented early on, and you might have seen this before, but these were sort of the regions and the months that I thought I would hit some of these places. So in August, I was over here in the Cascades of California and Oregon. Uh, and then in September, I thought I'd get to two places, but I really just mainly got to one. Um, and that was from Wyoming over into South Dakota into the Black Hills. Uh, I believe this trip here in Utah, I think I actually did take that trip in September. Maybe it was a, a couple weeks earlier. Nonetheless, I did do a small trip down into the Great Basin National Park region here. Um, I wasn't able to head over to Dinosaur National Park and parts of the Uinta Mountains around Vernal, Utah, like I'd hoped to. So that didn't happen. Uh, but I got over to the Central Sierras and Yosemite National Park in October. My wife went with me on that trip. That was, that was a lot of fun. She'd never been to Yosemite. And then I was planning to head down here in November, but if you remember correctly, that's when the whole Iceland um, news uh, event really took place. And so that really kept me busy through the month of November, but I was able to peel away and head down here in December a few weeks ago and do some videos around the Salton Sea and in the Mojave Desert. So there's still just so much of the West and that's just the United States to explore. There's a whole world out there, um, but this was the idea. And of course I'm located where the little star is here. So that was the idea. So I wanted to share just some, just some fun photos. Some of these might be places you recognize because I've already posted videos on these locations and others of, uh, some of the other photos I'll put, I'll show you here might just whet your appetite for videos to come. And so um, I did focus a little bit on national park lands because I do teach a class here at the college called Geology of National Parks. And so I wanted to get to a lot of different parks and monuments and showcase as much of the geology and the stories therein as I could. And some of these, again, were places I'd been to previously. Um, but a lot of them were brand new to me. And so that was exciting going someplace new for the first time. And a lot of them were places uh, that I thought had really exceptional geologic stories that could be told. And so there's a smattering there of just locations. You can read those as well as I can. Just I tried to take a picture of the little entrance sign as I went into each park. So, uh, so that's just a little snapshot, a little mosaic of some of the places I went to. Um, but in addition to parklands, you know, 
in driving from one place to another, I also would stop at any place that looked interesting, or in some instances, I had done my research ahead of time, and I looked at geologic field guides, published field guides, to kind of direct me to places that I thought had a pretty cool story to tell. And so this cool location here, this is a video that I'll put out sometime soon. Uh, this was a detachment fault, the Newberry Detachment Fault near Laughlin, Nevada. And I don't want to tell the story of each photo too much because I'll let the, the video do that. Um, but this is a, a beautifully exposed fault surface. You can see the color difference between the two different rock types and then the arrows there that I put there to annotate the movement. So this lighter colored rock is actually has been moved up. This is what we call the footwall side of the fault relative to these reddish rocks that have moved down, but just a beautiful, I mean, fault exposures don't get much better than that. Uh, just beautiful. So fun stuff like that, just maybe roadside areas. Um, this was a few weeks ago at Joshua Tree National Park. This photo nicely shows the light colored granitic rock. So this rock was all magma uh, during, I believe the Cretaceous period. So about 90 million years ago. And that rock, that magma chamber intruded existing rocks. And so these dark rocks you see above it are the rocks that were already there that the magma actually moved up into and intruded. And this is what we call a roof pendant. So if you want some more fun buzzwords in geology, and I know you do, because that's where it's at, right? Here is a fun little buzzword, a roof pendant. It's a uh, preserved section of rock that sits above the magma chamber. So it's the roof of the magma chamber, the area that the magma intruded. So Joshua Tree National Park, um, beautiful place. I'd been there before on a couple of climbing trips um, and hadn't really spent much time looking at the geology. So this was a nice chance for me to focus a little bit more. Uh, these are in no particular order. These are just kind of random. And I've only got a, maybe 12 or so photos here. So if you'll indulge me with the slideshow. Um, unfortunately, when I went to Northern California, and Lassen Peak National Park, the weather was was really socked in. It was uh, Hurricane Hillary, which you might remember had wreaked havoc in Mexico and Baja and had churned up through California, caused torrential rain and flooding in places like Death Valley uh, to the point that they had to close a lot of their roads for months. In fact, they may still have some roads closed. I'm not sure if that's correct. Uh, but this, this was like the, what the weather looked like there. Um, but this is a nice photo of a glacial erratic. This rounded rock was transported by ice coming off of the peak of Lassen Peak. Uh, and then as the ice retreated, that big boulder was deposited on these other rocks here. And you can see that they don't quite match, that the textures and even the colors of these rocks a little look a little bit different. So yeah, there's Lassen Peak. But unfortunately, I had I had big plans to do more there, including probably climb Lassen Peak, but the weather... Uh, did not cooperate, and I had a pretty limited window of time, so that was the best I could do. I did get a couple videos out for Lassen. I've got still one that I just don't know if it's worth pushing out there because there's not a whole lot to see because it was just so socked in with clouds and rain. Uh, South Dakota was a real awesome trip. I had never been to the Black Hills, but had always wanted to go there, and I was able to combine two of my passions on this trip, so I got out there and spent several days doing geology videos. And then I had a buddy fly out to Rapid City and I picked him up at the airport and we spent the next three days climbing in the area. So we climbed uh, on this Precambrian granite, like you see, we didn't climb any of the needles. Um, that would have been pretty sweet, but we climbed the same rock in a different area. And then we climbed in Spearfish Canyon, which is up to the North on some limestone. And then we wrapped up by climbing Devil's Tower. And many of you have probably seen that video. So the needles of South Dakota, uh, beautiful. You can see the fall colors there. It was just perfect time to be there. It wasn't too crowded, great temperatures, great colors. Uh, this is the trip I just did down into the Mojave of Southern California. I'm, I'm curious to see how many people actually know about this place. And I only know about this place because prior to coming to Twin Falls, in 2004 to teach here at the College of Southern Idaho, I began my college teaching career at um, a small college, a very small community college in California, in a small desolate town called Blythe, California. And if you know where that is, uh, you're probably laughing right now. And if you don't know where it is, you can look at it on a map and then 
and then think to yourself, oh boy, that looks rough. Uh, but it's right on the border between California and Arizona, right along the Colorado River. And this was a place I used to take my students on field trips, was up this narrow canyon called Gargoyle Canyon, which has really exceptional uh, geology. On, on the right side here at the bottom, you can see um, the dark gray, these are andesites, so these volcanic rocks. And then you can see these brown sedimentary deposits, these layered rocks with sand and gravel draped on top of them. So just a, that's a beautiful little uh, unconformity right there. It's got lots of other things as well. That video hasn't come out yet either, but it will hopefully soon. So Gargoyle Canyon. Um, I went to the Badlands of South Dakota. Um, what should I say about the Badlands? I don't want this to come across the wrong way. The Badlands were very pretty. It was a very windy day. Um, I was grateful to go there because I'd never been there before. There was some cool things to see. You can see some of these uh, in this lower left photo, this X in the rocks. Is, these are two clastic dikes. So these are not intrusions of magma like we see with igneous dikes, but these are actually fractures that formed in the sedimentary rocks that then filled with sedimentary material, uh, like sometimes sand. Um, so there was a couple cool things to see there. Uh, will I ever go back to the Badlands? I don't know, to be quite honest with you, and maybe I'm a little bit spoiled, um, you can see a lot of that similar topography and scenery in places like Southern Utah, other parts of the West. Um, so it was it was a long drive to get out there. But if I was, I could see how people maybe as you know, the country was settled and we emigrated westward. Uh, if you were coming from the Midwest or the East Coast, this would seem like quite the foreign landscape. Uh, but then you come further west and you can see a lot of these types of landscapes. So anyway, uh, but the Badlands are pretty cool. Uh, and there was, you know, um, lots of little, um, are they prairie dogs out there in places? And I did see some bison, which was pretty cool. This is in Anza Borrego State Park in Southern California near the Salton Sea. And these videos haven't come out yet. I've actually got a three-part series from this area. This is this is a geologic mecca, like Split Mountain Gorge. Holy cow, you could just soak up so much geology there. And what this photo nicely shows, and I don't have some scale here, but we're looking at a cliff that's maybe, oh, I don't know, 20 meters tall, about 60, 70 feet tall. And right there in the center, the rock face with the stripes on it, uh, those are slick inside. So this is a fault surface. And because in Southern California, we have so many strike slip faults where the, the rocks move sideways or laterally, this is where those two rocks across the fault have been pushed past each other. Uh, and that produces friction and it actually leaves scratch marks and a polished surface there. So this is actually the fault plane. And these are these beautiful uh, slick insides or sometimes called slick in lines. Um, whoops. Um, my phone just rang. My office. Okay, sorry. So that's Split Mountain Gorge. Lots of good stuff coming there. I had never been to Anza Borrego before, but it was well worth my time. I wish I'd had a little bit more time to be there, um, but I couldn't. So, okay. And then Devil's Post Pile. This video has already gone out, but this was another cool place that I hadn't been to before. Um, it was pretty exceptional. Let me turn my volume down on my phone so it doesn't do that again. Sorry about that. Yeah, these big hexagonal columns. And then across the top, you can see where they're, they've are they been polished by glaciers. So glaciers moved over the surface of these columns and left striations and scratch marks, a lot like faults. So faults and glaciers can produce similar uh, textures, patterns on the rock surface. Uh, it just takes a little deducing to figure out like, well, is, was this produced by glacial movement or is this produced by fault movement? So devil's post pile. Yep. Shout out Devil's Post Pile. There you go. This one hasn't gone out either. This is this one's kind of a funny story. Um, so right near Crowley Lake on the east side of the Sierras, north of Bishop, uh, California, are these kind of cool little columns of rock. This isn't the best photo. The water was pretty high, so I couldn't kind of get to the best spot to get the best photo. Um, 
so my wife was with me on this one and she was just, you know, along for the ride and she, she hiked down there, but Holy cow, like you go around to the East side of the lake, there's no signs or directions there, but there were so many cars there. Like this place, there was at least 50 people with dogs. It was a scene. And you're just like driving into the, on these roads in the middle of essentially nowhere. And you're like, where are all these people going? Well, this is where they were going. And all I could guess here was that they, you know, I think it's become kind of an Instagram kind of spot. And people go there to get the cool pictures or fly their drones around because um, there, there was really no rhyme or reason why so many people should be there. There's no signs there. It's not a, a, a designated landmark or it's not on any of the signs in the area. Um, so it was a little weird to make a video there. I felt a little bit rushed and you might sense that when you watch the video because it was just all these people kind of just talking and standing around and kind of watching me scramble around these things and, and film. Um, yeah, but these are pretty cool pretty cool features. They are not um, petrified trees. They have nothing to do with wood. These are actually uh, gas gases that were rising through these ash deposits. This is part of the Bishop Tuff. And anyway, I'll let the video explain the whole story there. But kind of a neat little spot. But the, the funny part of the story was just all the throngs of people there, which probably won't show up in the video because I tried to do a good job of not showing all the folks that were there. But anyway, there's a little bit of the backstory. Um, Lava Beds National Monument in Northern California was awesome. I wish I would have had a lot more time to spend here. There are so many lava tubes there. I mean, you if you like caves, you could spend a solid week there and and hit probably like, I don't know, 20, 30 caves easily. Um, I just didn't have the time there. But these are lava tubes. Um, lava tubes tend to be pretty straight, kind of like a subway tunnel. You can see the drip features here on the ceiling. I did do a video here, but again, team, I am not a videographer. I'm a hack. <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out as I go. And because it's in a dark environment and the lighting is tricky, I did get some footage and some of it's good enough, but others of it is not so good. So I, I probably need to look at that and decide if it's worth putting it out there for the masses or if I'm just going to get uh, ridiculed, but really cool lava tubes. And this was the one, one of the ones I went in out there. Uh, many of you've seen the, the Pyramid Lake Tufa video that went out uh, several months ago, but this is another shot of some of these collapsed Tufa vents that form towers around Pyramid Lake in Northern Nevada. Uh, so that was a really neat place that I hadn't, I'd driven by it, but I didn't really spend much time there before. Um, Crater Lake, that I had, I think, four videos on Crater Lake that went out, one of which was a pretty popular one um, that was pretty awesome. And actually, I, I just as a little bit of a side note on that video, I had a producer from the Weather Channel contact me and they were doing they're doing a series it's already out there i think it's called earth unlocked something like that i probably botched the title but it's earth something not earth revealed earth unlocked is what is kind of resonating in my brain at any rate um they actually contacted me asked a lot about crater lake wanted me to come out there but I just couldn't swing it because it was like Halloween time and I had family obligations and whatnot. But as it turned out anyway, there was too much snow along the rim that they couldn't get to the place they wanted to to film, which is the place I had done the videotape. So they they are licensing some of that footage for their um, for this segment that they'll have. I think it'll air next year. And then they also had someone come out and interview me with a bunch of, it was kind of weird. It was just like a a whole page and a half of just somewhat random geology questions that they kind of hit me with rapid fire. And we were outside. It was freezing cold. Um, I don't feel like it was my best, best performance, but they said it turned out fine. So anyway, you, you might see me briefly um, on a weather channel show in, in the next year or so. So that's kind of fun. And, I'll, and once that comes out, I'll be sure to post it or uh, link it somehow so you guys know about it. But Crater Lake was awesome. I actually got to take uh, a boat ride out to the lake and hike to the top of Wizard Island. They had just started running the boat shuttles 
for the first time in three years uh, due to COVID. So the timing worked out really great and it was, it was awesome. I, I thoroughly enjoyed my visit out there. Um, I went out to Mount Rushmore and that was pretty cool too. I do have a, a video I need to put together on Mount Rushmore's rocks. Not so much the history of the carving of the faces, um, which I know a little bit about, but not a lot, but mainly the rock types themselves. And the geology of this cliff face actually played a pretty prominent role in how the four faces ended up being uh, carved into the rock. So I learned a lot. So for example, I'll give you guys a little, a little spoiler tease here. Um, so this is, I believe, Washington's on the left. And notice you can see like down to his, like there's some lapels, right, of his jacket. But then there's all this cleared off rock further down as if they were going to do more. And the original plan was it was going to show him almost down to his waist uh, in terms of the, the profile of him. But because they ran into this other rock type, this, this is schist down here, this dark gray rock that the granite, which is the lighter colored rock, intrudes. And because it has a very different... Uh, texture and it breaks differently and in terms of like sculpting it's just a totally different medium to try to you know shape uh, that was kind of a deal breaker uh, along with maybe some budget issues that they had as well so anyway there's a little bit of a teaser there but the original design was to show the four presidents nearly down to their waist but it's certainly like from the chest up and and it turned out to just be mostly neck up as it turned out so Kind of a cool little story there, a little backstory for you. Um, this was near Fremont Canyon in Wyoming. This one I haven't put out yet either. So lots more videos to come. I'm just trying to get to them all. This is a nice little, this could have been a road cut because it was a road cut. I just, but I patched it together with um, some stuff I did at Fremont Canyon because it was very close by. This is some Precambrian granite in the lower half of the of this photo. And then there's the obvious reddish contact right there through the middle and that's the great unconformity and then sitting on top of that are cambrian age sandstones this is the flathead sandstone sitting on top of that so uh, really cool exposure of uh, the great unconformity which is one of the cooler features in the western u.s i think geologically and i've showcased that on a couple other videos one down in the Grand Canyon, one in the Wasatch, one near uh, Cody, Wyoming. But this was just another place to see it. I, I almost feel like I could, you know, every place I see the Great Unconformity, I could do a little video and then make a big collage or something at some point. Uh, we're almost through the, these here, team. So this is, so there's a funny story with this one. This is in Utah. This is called Lace Curtain. It sits on the north side of a volcano called Pavant Butte. And where's the video for this one? Well, <clears throat> somehow I inadvertently deleted part, part of this video. So I need to go back there this next year and refilm this one. Uh, but this was a really cool spot, really cool story. This is actually uh, a tufa or travertine calcium carbonate that's coated, coating the rock here, but really neat area. Um, okay, so that's my synopsis on my sabbatical just like just some fun little photos to to tease and tempt you with and motivate you um and so you should see some of those videos coming soon and now i want to focus a little bit on some upcoming youtube field trips so if you're not sure what this is all about in october of this past year i took the plunge and um, promoted a southern Idaho field trip for YouTube viewers. And I thought, well, let's see how this goes. I've never done this before. I've, I've done field trips with students. I've done field trips for organizations, but I've never just broadcast some dates to YouTube viewers and really gone down that path before. But it turned out great. So here's a photo of the folks that showed for one of the two days. So we did two different days. And I took them to different spots around South Central Idaho. We had an amazing group of people. And because that experience turned out so awesome, uh, that sort of has whet my appetite to do more uh, of these types of, I guess, outreach um, educational opportunities. Because that's where the real learning happens, right? We can all watch YouTube. We can learn a lot this way. We can learn a lot in a classroom, in a book. But holy cow, like being out in the field at an outcrop, 
with your hand on the rock, looking at it with other people and discussing it, that that really is the superlative uh, experience, in my opinion. So I haven't got hard dates on these yet, but I would like to redo this field trip. So I guess these dozen or so folks probably won't show up unless they wanted to do it all over again. Um, so hopefully we get a new batch of people for that. But sometime in April, and this will probably be on a weekend, um, we'll do the same trip that I did for them. Um, and that'll be around the Twin Falls area. So the idea with these is that you would come to Twin Falls however you want to, and then you can camp or stay in a hotel, whatever whatever works best for you. Uh, and then we meet each day, go out, carpool, do a caravan together, and uh, do a field trip in the region. And then we'll do that for two days. You, If you can only show up for one of the two days, that's fine. You just sign up for whichever day works for you. Uh, and then in June, I thought we would try some other places. And again, I am kind of starting close to home because that's easier for me and works with my schedule. I do have plans longer term to maybe expand the scope and maybe it'll be something like, yeah, let's go down to, uh, you know, the salt and trough in Southern California in December or November for three or four days and and do a field trip down there. But right now I'm just kind of starting close. That That feels like a good plan, baby steps, right? Uh, so sometime in June over weekend, uh, a day at Craters of the Moon, which I know quite well, probably a day in and around the city of Rocks region um, and maybe some other stuff in there as well. So these are just, I'm at least giving you like a month and some destinations right now. The Grand Canyon River trip that I've announced previously for um, 2025, that's actually filled up. So I we have 17 people um, that have paid a deposit that are locked and loaded uh, and ready to do that. And that's again with a, a separate outfitter, Western Rivers Expeditions. Um, so that trip's full. You can get on the waiting list for that one because there's you know a, a good chance that a couple of those folks may need to drop between now and then. 2025 is a year and a half away and someone could have some life issue or something pop up on their radar that would prohibit them from going. So uh, if you're interested in that, getting on the waiting list would be a good idea. Or you might, if you're on the waiting list, you're also on the list for the 2026 trip. But we won't have dates or details on that um, until the fall of this next year, fall 2024. That's just the way the Park Service works with their permits and the launch dates and that sort of thing. But but if you have questions on any of these trips, you can uh, shoot me an email um, and let me know you're interested and we can kind of take it from there. I'll, I'll give you more of a heads up as we get, as we roll into the new year, probably around like February or so, I'll give you some uh, details and dates on these first two here. And there may be some other ones as well. These are just, you know, in sitting down the last few days, these are the trips I've kind of thought about and the ones that I want to kind of pursue going forward. So, so there you go. Hopefully that uh, is exciting and helpful, but I would like to do more things like this as much as I'm able to. Please also remember that um, as much as I was able to do this semester on sabbatical in terms of pushing out a lot of videos, traveling a lot um, that starting in January, I go back to my real job, which is teaching college classes. And so anything I'm doing over here with you good folks on YouTube is is on the side and I'll do as much as I can, but just realize I've got some limits on time and, and bandwidth. And so um, I'll probably never be able to do as much as, as would make everyone happy, but I'll, I'll try to do uh, some good balance in there that'll It'll hopefully hit hit a good balance that uh, works for everyone. So anyway, um, okay. So with that, uh, let's turn our attention to uh, Iceland and do a little brief update on things happening in Iceland. And so I'm assuming many of you have been following my updates there over the past, um, I guess, month or so since... Um, early November. And so we'll go through the data first, look at the earthquake data, the GPS ground deformation data, um, and then we'll get to a couple other things here as well. This will be pretty brief though. This will probably just be like five minutes or so. So in terms of earthquake data, here's our map of earthquakes over the last 24 hours. Now we did have yesterday, 
which was a uh, Tuesday, two magnitude two quakes that happened along this northeast southwest trend, or what what we're what we're interpreting as the the magma intrusion, the dike that formed around November 10th. We think that this dike has mostly solidified or is in the process of solidifying. Um, so a lot of these earthquakes may be related to cooling and contraction. They could be related to just you've changed the stress conditions in the rock. And so you would expect the rock to have some period, which could take months of responding to that change in stress. Uh, and so these are the earthquakes we see again over the last 24 hours. If we try to select anything above a magnitude two, nothing. So over the last day, there's been no magnitude two or greater. Magnitude ones, we've got a few in there. Um, so, but we don't have any data to suggest that these earthquakes are related to renewed magma input or injection into the system. So we think these earthquakes might just be that magma cooling, contracting uh, as it as it shifts and moves and solid starts to solidify. That could be triggering a lot of these smaller earthquakes. Uh, so we can see the town of Grindavik down here, the fishing harbor town uh, at the south end. This town is still evacuated, uh, at least during the evening. And I'll, I'll get to that here in a second. But let's look at a... GPS station. So there's a GPS station right about here, which is right, right where the power plant is. And this is the data we want to focus on here. So remember on these GPS plots, there's always three graphs, one that shows movement of the station in a north-south direction. So you can see right here where it changes. This is uh, three months time. So this is August, let's see, no, September, October, November, and then December. So the numbers across the bottom are days of, of those respective months. And you can see the big kick here, that's the November 9th or 10th event. So you can see that this station, this particular station near the power plant moved to the north um, and has been continuing to move to the north. So it's moving away uh, from the south. It's moving more and more to the north over time. So that indicates that's part of the uplift story. Here's our east-west plot here. And this one shows downward movement, but remember this is east. So a negative east motion would basically be west. So the same station here around November 10th or so started moving west. And this is when the, the magma movement um, really took place. And that's when they had a lot of earthquakes. And this is the most telling one. The one that we want to spend the most time on is this bottom one, which shows uplift. So we can see uh, September, October, not a lot of movement. Then starting in late October, uh, the area starts to move up. That's what we would call inflation, where we interpreted that movement as magma moving into the crust, moving into the subsurface. So it's causing the land to rise. And then you can see it just drops. So it drops here because that magma moved from this location over to the east where we saw that nice linear trend of earthquakes. And so the magma moved away, the ground dropped at this location. And since that time, around November 10th, the area has been fairly steadily um, uplifting or inflating. And so the real critical thing that we're waiting to see is when these red dots here on the right side, which goes up to about today, I think it might be a day or two old, um, when that dot there gets near this dot here. So right at around 100 millimeters or 10 centimeters of uplift, I'm interested to see what happens when we get to that point, because that was the trigger point. The area uplifted to about that uh, amount, and then that's what caused the magma, which was probably overpressurized at that point to move to other regions and cause uh, so, so much of the damage and kind of chaos that ensued. And since that time, it's been continuing to steadily re-inflate. Um, and so what happens when we get back to that, you know, 100 millimeters or so of uplift? Maybe it exceeds it. Maybe it, no big change and it continues to uplift because now we've changed the, the stress conditions and there's maybe more space uh, in the subsurface for the magma to intrude, or maybe that's another that's a trigger point, and we might see that magma then move into some other region. So that's that's what we're kind of waiting for. At least I am. That's that's what I think will be 
interesting to see. I can't make a prediction as to what's going to happen. I could I could see it going a couple different ways there. Let's look at the Met Office uh, update. So this is from their uh, geologic agency, their scientific agency. And re remember, as we read these, that they've been usually Google translated into English. So sometimes it's it, the wording can be a little bit off. But uh, the area around Svartsengi, so that's the power plant, continues to, continues to inflate. Rate of inflation has decreased a little bit since Friday. Okay, and this is updated as of today, December 13th. Uh, but it's still greater than it was prior to the formation of the dike that traveled under Grindavik November 10th. So we're still seeing a pretty steady and notable increase in elevation or what we're interpreting as inflation. Uh, while magma continues to accumulate around the power plant, further dikes or an eruption remain possible. So we don't know which way this is going to go. The magma could just start moving around in the subsurface and never actually breach the surface and create an eruption. On the other hand, we could go quite quickly from um, having magma in the subsurface to within a matter of a few hours, perhaps, magma actually erupting. And that's why the public officials there are so guarded about just letting people back into the town uh, without any sort of protocols in place. Um, that if if the eruption occurred, and we don't even know where the eruption would occur, but if the eruption occurred and you had 4,000 people in their homes in the town, would you have the ability to uh, evacuate them in a, in a quick way? And, you know, if we look at the, you know, just the topography here, I mean, and just that, you know, you, if the lava is coming more or less down this road, or if this road is compromised, um, you've got the sea on one side of the town, two roads on the other, and then you'd be looking at trying to get people out of harm's way within maybe only a few hours. And that's that's a daunting task. And so uh, I certainly haven't second guessed any of their decisions so far. I think they've been pretty wise and prudent in what they've been doing. But at the same time, I recognize that, <clears throat> excuse me, that the it's been a hardship for the residents there not being able to be in their homes. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, let's see. If another dike forms, it's considered to be likeliest that would follow the same path as the November 10th dike. So they're saying that, hey, the most likely outcome is that the magma that's continuing to intrude under the power plant is going to move off to the east <clears throat> and reoccupy that northeast, southwest trending dike uh, that it did at the beginning of November. Uh, most likely location for a potential eruption uh, is assumed, assessed to be north of Grenindivik in the direction of Hagafelt and the area around Sununuka Gigar, so the old crater row that exists there. So what they're saying there is uh, based on everything we know that the most likely eruption location, so here's, uh, let me add a couple fun labels here that might help any folks. So there's Power Plant, Blue Lagoon, which is a big tourist attraction. Um, here's the prior eruptions in Iceland in the last three years. And the area we're really looking at is kind of in between these three hills. Um, this looks like the most prime area for the eruption to occur, or possibly if you look over here, you'll see this older chain of uh, craters that I've kind of outlined with this red line, and it could be over there as well, but definitely in this region. So if you're uh, taking bets, this would be the most likely area for us to have an eruption if we were to have an eruption. Um, and... Yeah, I think that's it on that one. In other news there, they uh, here's a news story that Amanda Joe sent me, so thank you. But it sounds like they've, they've been working on building a, a barrier, a wall, a berm, if you will, around the power plant. So they're basically um, collecting local rock and sediment um, and bulldozing it into a, 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 a berm. Um, and that's about three meters tall. And it sounds like they're just about done. Um, so they expect to be done pretty soon. Uh, they've been working, I think, around the clock, like 24-7, lots of heavy equipment. So that's a nice photo there where you can see the um, the town in the background and then all the heavy equipment there. So that's looking to the south. And uh, another view here, make that a little bit bigger for you. And so here's the power plant at the upper left corner. And you can see what they've actually done here. It's a little hard to tell because of the snow, I think. Um, but it looks to me like they're actually digging a bit of a moat 
on the, in this case, that would be the east side or the out, the area outside of the power plant. Um, so the idea that the lava would come down into that and they're, they're taking that material, they're digging out of the moat and then piling that up here to make this wall or berm even taller. Uh, and it's a good idea. I think it's, you know, whether we get an eruption sometime soon uh, or sometime in the next few years, this is a good idea for them to just focus on doing this now. And I think there was one more photo. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's sort of the same thing, I guess. But you can see, yeah, there's a a, a bulldozer right there. Um, you can see that black. So there's using the existing rock or bringing in some of the cinders. There's a power plant on the left um, to build that fortification, that wall around the area. So really good idea uh, and really great. So, and then I haven't used this map as much, but uh, I'll let, for those of you interested in Iceland, Google Earth works great and it has its advantages, but it also has some, some drawbacks. One of the drawbacks to Google Earth, of course, is the imagery is only as current as it is current, right? So if I come over here to where the last three eruptions are, I come over here to this year's eruption in 2023, notice that the Google Earth imagery, I don't know if you can see the little date down there at the bottom, uh, but it's from April 13th, which is before the eruption. So this does not show, it's not updated to show the lava flow that took place here from this eruption. But this other website, which is just map.is, uh, is a really nice one. It has really good detail. And so this one actually does nicely show, here's the 2021 uh, Fagra Dadelsfjat eruption. Here's the 2022 eruption around Meradalir. Uh, and I was there for that one. And then it shows also the Litli Frutur eruption of 2023. So there's the main eruptive cone there. You can see all the lava. And then this is actually pretty cool too and interesting. So you can see the lava and then beyond the lava, here's the edge of the lava. Then there's this kind of brown area. This is actually where the moss caught on fire. As many of you know who've been to Iceland, a lot of the landscape is covered in this thick spongy moss, but this occurred in the summertime and either the heat of the lava and maybe the moss was a little bit dry. I don't know what the climate conditions were like at the time, but the moss actually caught on fire and you can see sort of that burned area extending out. So just want to make you aware of this as a resource as well. It's, it's got nice imagery, um, very clear and crisp, shows the roads. It also shows uh, the name of all the, the Icelandic names of all the landforms. Um, and I've been able to use this to pick out some nice things like here's a, a shield volcano and this little trail of little pits, I think is a collapsed lava tube coming off of that shield volcano. Um, and then you have these steeper slopes here. So really there's kind of three different volcanic um, events that took place here. You have these steeper hills, the more prominent topographic features, which are subglacial volcanoes, volcanoes that erupted when this area was covered with ice. Uh, and then you have this shield volcano here would have occurred after the ice had retreated, but before this crater row erupted, because you can see this lava flow kind of wrapping around it here. So you can kind of interpret some of those things a bit. So, um, okay. I think I got through all the stuff I wanted to. And so what we can do now, and we've got 581 people um, about 45 minutes into this thing, which is awesome, is we can address any questions you have. So I'm going to scroll quickly through the chat and see if there's any any questions I can help address. And if you have any questions right now, you can just type those in all caps. Uh, so from Weeping Scorpion, they ask, will we ever see the Salton Basin reconnected with the ocean? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so let's, we'll use Google Earth to maybe zip around, hopefully not make you seasick, but we'll zip over here too the Salton Sea region of Southern California, California's largest body of water. So here is California, the border with Arizona. Let's take the labels off. That's a little messy. And maybe let's take the roads off too. There we go. So here's the border with Mexico. Here's California. Um, and this big body of water here is what's called the Salton Sea. 
And holy cow, to tell the story of the Salton Sea would probably be a, a 20 to 30 minute lecture. So um, let me just address the question that this person asked. So you can see that the Salton Sea is pretty close to the Gulf of California. And if you look at elevations in this area, you can see all the farming that takes place here. This area is below sea level. So you have Palm Springs up here to the north, uh, the Imperial Valley down here to the south of the Salton Sea, and, and agriculture is king here. Um, they've got great soils. They've got access to water through the Colorado River. There's a series of canals that bring Colorado River water over into the Salton Trough. And so because this area is below sea level, it might not be uh, too big of a stretch of imagination to say, well, wait a minute, maybe the, the ocean has been in this area before. And it actually has been during the Pliocene, about four, maybe five million years ago, the Gulf of California extended all the way into the Salton Trough and up the Colorado River uh, region as well. So this was air, area was all underwater at one point. So will, will we ever see the Salton Basin connected with the ocean? Uh, we won't in terms of us individually. Will, will someone, will there be people to witness that? Possibly. Um, the only thing keeping the ocean from reoccupying this land is the Colorado River over time has built up a big enough delta that it's high enough that it's keeping it at bay. But it's only, you can see the elevations there maybe at the bottom right of the screen. It's only about 40 feet, maybe like 13 meters or so uh, higher than the sea. So yeah, good question. Um, okay, let's go to the next question. Um, is there any features you didn't notice until you reviewed pictures footage later? This is from Eric's Automotive. Um, yeah, he asked that a while ago, so I'm not sure what, what he was talking about. Definitely, as I've done the videos, um, if I see anything that I didn't notice while filming it, I try to add annotations to point that out. A good example of that is I just reposted the a Yellowstone video I did over a year ago. And in the process of recording it, I'm like, hey, there's a cute little normal fault. And so I actually uh, can can pause the video or more or less, you know, splice in a photo and then annotate that a little bit. So definitely I, I see things after the fact sometimes. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see other questions here. I'm looking for either my name or something in big bold letters. And I'm starting back at the beginning. So I'm kind of in the section where uh, I was showing all the photos there. Um, secrets, secrets of the earth. No, I think it was called, uh, I could look it up real quick, Renee. Uh, she's asking about the weather channel show. It might've been, I still feel like it was earth unlocked or something like that. I probably have it written down somewhere. Shoot. Not sure, but it was something like that. It was two words. It was earth something. And that something was just one word. Um, Let's see. Okay. Did you visit the crate? Yes, I did. Hardnack Farms asked if I visited the crazy, crazy Horse Monument. I did. I did not do a video there. Uh, this was kind of when my buddy showed up and it was after we'd climbed and we're just kind of winding down the day. Um, the Crazy Horse Monument is awesome. It's pretty, it's huge. Um, I have no idea how long it's going to take them to finish that thing because it is so it's such a big project and so massive that I just don't know how long it's going to take to get that thing done. Um, so if you don't know what I'm talking about in the Black Hills of South Dakota, we have Mount Rushmore, which is a, uh, on a cliff of granite Four residents of the U S have been, had their faces sculpted into the side of the mountain. Um, and the native Americans who, call this area home, at least one of their chiefs thought they should do something similar. And so they have a, a monument to one of their leaders um, and it's called Crazy Horse. And so it's right here off the highway. And so this is, oh, I guess it's run by like a nonprofit. Um, this doesn't do it justice, but the only thing they've got really um, that's outlined you can get on the internet and look look this up if you're interested is um his face or at least most of his face and his arm kind of pointing forward but it's going to eventually have the horse um his torso up it's a pretty big project um but it's 
happening at a pretty slow pace. So we'll see how long that takes. But I did, I was able to go there. So, um, okay, just scrolling through, looking for some other questions. There's the crazy horse one. The world unlocked. Yeah, maybe something like that, Jeffrey Porter. Um, yeah, I don't have dates for the April trip yet. I need to just kind of check calendars, things with my wife to make sure I don't, um, her birthday's in April. So I want to make sure I steer clear of any conflicts there. Um, let's see. Folks talking about other things. I'm just looking for a question. Let's see here. Yeah, appreciate all the likes and folks who've offered donations. That's always much appreciated. Um, yeah, Mandy Joe, good to see you in there answering questions. Yeah, so Mandy Joe is also goes by Amanda Joe. She's my contact in uh, Grindavik, and so she, if you have, if you want to know things about how the situation is really unfolding for her, someone that's being directly impacted. Um, directing questions to her would be great because I'm just a middleman. Um, yeah, the hotspot is under Vatnat Jokult, which is a big, the big, the biggest ice cap in Iceland off to the east. So she sounds like she's handling that well. Um, oh, I didn't mention the Zent, the Nick Zentner thing. Maybe I should do that real quick before I forget. And I don't know if he's announced it, so, but we already agreed to it. So I feel like it's, it's fair game. So he's doing currently a ice age flood A to Z series. Many of you are following that very passionately, which is great. Um, and so I emailed him a few weeks ago and said, Hey, I don't, if you've got this all planned out A through Z, that's great. But if you're also looking for content or things to fill in this series, um, I've done quite a bit on the Bonneville flood. It really is an Ice Age flood. It's the fl Ice Age flood that people tend to overlook or forget. I feel like it's the the ignored ugly stepchild of, of Ice Age floods. And I would be happy to be on your program if you want to discuss the Bonneville flood. And he said, that sounds great. And so right now we have scheduled preliminarily uh, Sunday, February 4th. Um, unless he changes something, which he can, it's his show. I will be on with Nick uh, to talk about the Bonneville flood. So there you go. Some of you have been hoping that we would get together. We've actually met before. We know each other, um, but this will be a, a more recent. And I guess in the YouTube world, they call these collabs, like collaboration. So yeah, that's the cool, that's the cool kid lingo. Um, in the social media world that I'm slowly learning. Um, all right, let's see if there's any other questions. Dates for the April field trip from Brian. See if I can dovetail with Nick's downtown lectures in Ellensburg. Yeah, I'll try to make sure when I'm planning things that I at least um, check and see if he's got something planned because we are tapping uh, dominantly very similar, uh, the same audience or largely the same audience with a lot of overlap. Uh, so I'll make sure that when I plan that, I'm not jumping on his toes or something that he's got planned there. Um, let's see, do we have from James, do we have any updates on the magma flow into the dike? In terms of the rate, um, I think it's, I did that calculation on one of the previous updates and I think the uplift is at about the same rate. So the magma inflow into the area under the power plant is probably about the same. But right now, there's no evidence that the magma is moving from there over into the dike. And so we don't have any um, evidence that the magma is moving. And I'll show you kind of quickly here with the map, if that helps. Um, so the magma body seems to be about in this area, just southeast-ish of the power plant. Um, the the dike or the intrusion sits somewhere over here, and maybe I'd move it a little bit over. But right now, there's no evidence that suggests that the magma is actively still moving into that region. So, um, yeah, good question from Guler. What is your favorite looking volcano? Hmm, like in terms of just aesthetics, um, 
favorite looking volcano, like a specific volcano or a type of volcano, I'm going to go with, gosh, I love them all so much. Um, I do like basaltic volcanoes, maybe a little bit more, maybe because that's some, because I'm surrounded by them. Okay. I know what I like. And some of you won't be surprised by this. I like the Friato magmatic volcanoes, the lava water interaction volcanoes. So I'm going to go with uh, a tough cone as my favorite looking volcano. It's explosive, but not too explosive. I don't know. I think it's got a, it's got a lot going for it. Uh, from Charlie, what's interesting about the geology in Blythe, California? Huh. Yeah, right. Um, well, there's not much else going for it. Um, <laughs> And I shouldn't disparage the the town or anything, but it was it was it was a tough go for my wife and I and our young daughter when we lived there. Uh, so Blythe, California, sits here. Um, so here's Palm Springs. This is Interstate. Let's add the roads real quick. Here's Interstate 10 going over to Phoenix, and it was here. But the geology was great. Um, Gargoyle Canyon's just down here to the south. Holy cow, the Big Maria Mountains north of Blythe um, are very much studied by geologists. They more or less have a complete section of the Grand Canyon stratigraphy, layered rocks, but they've been highly metamorphosed and stretched. So instead of the Kaibab limestone that you would see in the Grand Canyon, it's the Kaibab marble, or instead of the Coconino sandstone you would see at the Grand Canyon. It's the Coconino quartzite. So it's the metamorphic equivalent to that stack of sedimentary rocks uh, that's preserved in the Big Maria Mountains here, which is pretty cool. Um, so there's really exquisite geology, you know, I mean, throughout this Mojave region. Every mountain range is very different in terms of the rocks it has, there's structures, there's volcanics, there's metamorphics, there's some sediments. Um, it's pretty awesome. Um, but it's also 120 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. Uh, it's brutally hot. Um, yeah, it was it was it was rough. We lasted two years there, and then uh, we got we came to Idaho, and we're happy up here. Um, yeah, as a software engineer, what can we do to help slash improve help improve earthquake forecasting and modeling? Oh, good question. Um, I am not a seismologist. I mean, the the holy grail of earthquake, I think, okay, for, okay, so let's be careful here. Earthquake prediction, there's no way currently to predict an earthquake. There's no way to know. And by prediction, remember, we mean specific location, magnitude, um, and time. So a prediction would be, hey, there's going to be a magnitude 5.6 earthquake, uh, 10 kilometers below Brawley, California on January 1st, 2024 at 2 p.m. or something like that. That's a prediction. A forecast is different. A forecast is just um, like a weather forecast. It's based on probabilities, a little bit different. Um, I think things that would help forecasting and modeling, one is we need bigger data sets. So the further back in time we can go in understanding earthquake behaviors in a given fault system. So let's take this, the San Andreas Fault, which starts near the Salton Sea on the east, east shore here, and then continues uh, all the way through California. If we could take, we only know maybe back to a few thousand years in terms of earthquake frequency and magnitudes, but if we could somehow push that data archive further back and have a bigger data set, we could probably make better, not predictions, sorry, better forecasts about earthquakes, frequencies, and that sort of thing. So um, I don't know if that helps from a software engineer point of view, but um, bigger data sets are always helpful because they tell you more about how the system works and um, helps you make more, have more confidence in your, in your forecasting. Um, from... When will filling up those cracks in town really make it safe to drive on? Well, if there's no, she's talking about Grindavik now, if there's no further earthquake activity or subsidence or sinking of the ground uh, beneath Grindavik, then they could completely fill those in. They could totally make it safe to drive on. Um, but the real question is what's going to happen moving forward? Uh, from CZ, can the crystals and gas and magma be regarded as a multi-phase colloidal suspension um i think you talked right over the top of my head i don't know i don't know <laughs> um 
I don't know much about a multi-phase colloidal, colloidal suspension, so I can't address that. That sounds like a really good question for someone, though. Uh, from Mark, what makes the the TO layer a seismic? There have been several quite shallow earthquakes. Today. Is the seismic level known for this area? What makes the... And then he just has TO there, so I don't know. I'm not sure what he's asking there. The top layer, maybe it's meaning the top layer aseismic. Yeah, so some of these shallow earthquakes, um, I wouldn't say they're aseismic because they do produce earthquakes, but the instruments can sometimes only resolve, you know, it doesn't have resolution like down to the meter per se. And so there's there's some limitations with the instrumentation. And then there's the behavior of rocks with stress at depth that can change as well. So I know I'm probably not answering your question. I'm just trying to give you the best bit of information I can on that. Uh, Mandy Joe says there's a bit of debate on whether there's a hot spot in Iceland under Vatnat Jokult. And so, yes, there is. And I had a graphic. Oh, I don't know where to find it. So I don't want to take you on a mad tour of my desktop. But more or less, the hot spot in Iceland is more or less uh and maybe we can maybe we could draw this on here or something let's, whoops let's make it a polygon is more or less this is quick and crude team so don't hold me to it um is something like that uh, hopefully you can see that i'll maybe make that let's give it some yeah there's a red color and i'll make it a little bit thicker so you can see the area I just outlined there. Um, more or less, the head of the hotspot is coming up in that region. Um, so what that means is that it's a little bit messy. So we think that the volcanism that's taking place over here in the Reykjanes Peninsula is mostly driven by tectonics, by the plate boundary. The plate boundary is spreading is what drives a lot of the volcanic activity, not so much the um, the hotspot, which sits over here. That being said, the hotspot is at depth and it can, as it rises towards the surface, it doesn't always necessarily need to come up vertically. It can have little um, fingers that deviate off of that hotspot. So, you know, even though I drew my red little border there, I can't say for sure that there isn't some hotspot related activity that might take place outside that zone. So that could drive some of the um, volcanism over in this region. And this is near uh, Laki. This is the big eruption in 1783 that was huge. Um, so did hotspot volcanism influence that? I'm not sure. It might have. Um, but certainly this this is pretty well established. The, the head of the plume coming from the mantle, the hotspot itself, is pretty much right about where I've shown it here. So thanks for giving me a heads up on that, Mandy, and maybe that helped a little bit. Um, Judy Bug wants to know probability of another volcanic event like Mount St. Helens in the Northwest US. You guys are just making me go back and forth. So exhausting. Um, well, I don't know. Probability of a volcanic Event. Oh, like Mount St. Helens. Okay, so she wants a Mount St. Helens type eruption like 1980. So she wants an explosive eruption in the Northwest. Uh, and where would that most likely be? Well, the place we don't want it um, from a humanity standpoint uh, is Rainier. We, the more, you know, if a big eruption at Rainier, or not even a big eruption, would cause a lot of problems to a lot of people. Um, let me get rid of the roads. A likely place that we might see um, an eruption might be uh, the Three Sisters near Bend. Those have shown signs of unrest. St. Helens is certainly a big candidate as well. Uh, in fact, if you look at the last three, 4,000 years, St. Helens is quite the restless teenager. Some of these other ones like Mount Adams, Mount Hood have much less frequent eruptions over time. St. Helens has a lot of eruptions. Uh, so if I had to make a bet on which 
of the Cascade Range volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest would be most likely to have an explosive event next. Um, I would say St. Helens or one of the, and the South Sister. That would be the two I would go with just based on their past history. Doesn't mean we couldn't get something at Shasta or Lassen or something like that. Probability though is probably pretty low. So Judy Bug, um, what is the chance of another explosive event in the next 10 years? Probably really low, single digits. Uh, next 30 years, a little bit greater because you're looking at a bigger time frame. So yeah, good question. Um, did the power plant in Iceland make the volcano erupt? That's a good question. No, it did not. The power plant in Iceland taps hot water near the surface. Um, it's a different system. It's it's heated by hot rocks. You don't even need magma to produce geothermal energy. Um, you just need to have hot rocks that have a good plumbing system, like you have fractures and a plumbing system that can bring that hot water to the surface. So um, no, the power plant did not make, the, make it erupt at all. Um, let's see, other questions here. Good sorts of things happening. Earth Unlocked. Yeah, maybe that's the name of the show. Other people looked it up. So there we go. Um, question. I live on the Wasatch Front in Utah. This is from Rick. I would like to better understand how extensional forces in the Great Basin cause mountain uplift. Seems counterintuitive. Um, yeah, that's probably a good topic for another another time or video, I suppose, Rick. I don't I don't probably don't have the time to dive into that and give you the full skinny on that. Um, Cause you're right. When you extend something or stretch the crust, it, it might make some sense for things to go down, but it might not make sense in your, in your mind or others minds for things to also rise. So what he's talking about here is the Wasatch mountains, which go up over uh, 11,000 feet, you know, um, however many meters that is 3000 meters plus um, have been pushed up. And the valley has been pushed down along the Wasatch Faults. There's a, a segment of it here. Uh, and then there's an, and then you can see there it's kind of an, a curvature or arcuate segment. Then there's another one here called the Weber segment. Uh, and this extends all the way up into, into Idaho. It's about a couple hundred miles long, um, I believe. Yeah, I probably can't dive into that too much. Daryl, if you want to um, get... In on field trips, probably best thing to do is email me and let me know. SeanWilsey at gmail.com is a good email address. Um, I think I missed one though. Let's see. From Venture Off Road, have you ever found rocks you could could not identify all the time? <laughs> yeah. So as cool as I might look or as knowledgeable as I might look, identifying rocks in the videos, um, what you're not seeing is all the times I pick up rocks on my own out in the field. And I'm like, I have no idea what this is. But usually you can just start with those observations, right? I know I know what the color is. I should be able to figure out if it's igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic. Does it have crystals? Does it not? What's the texture? And so sometimes you're not quite sure what to call it, or sometimes descriptions and identify and rock names don't fit really well. Um, and so you're kind of left. Yeah, but absolutely. The answer to your question is yes, absolutely, all the time. Um Good question. Uh, thoughts on, from Kevin, thoughts on the mud pots working the way under the railroad tracks and highway in the Salton Sea area. I had heard about that, Kevin, and I didn't take the time on my last visit to go uh, look at those. I didn't know, know exactly where they were. The The good mud pots, I used to take students there, uh, used to be uh, somewhere in here. Um, if I can see the road names, I would know. There's like a field where you can actually see all these. What he's talking about is the um, there's the geothermal area. There's geothermal power plants in this area, and there is water. Sometimes, periodically, hot water mixed with mud oozes out of the ground and makes these cool little mud pot things and little mud volcanoes, kind of like what you might see uh, if you were in... Yellowstone or someplace like that. Um, I know it's somewhere in here. Oh, this is where it was. Yep. 
So these used to be active when I used to take students here. So if I kind of zoom in, you might see these kind of gray blobs in here. But these, I think, have gone inactive from what I understand. And now there's a new place somewhere over here. Yeah, right there where they're kind of bubbling up. So you can see these rounded depressions. You can see the water and then the gray there. So these are some of these new mud volcanoes. But he's referring to another one that was near the train tracks and they were having some subsidence issues there. I, I didn't go visit that spot though. Um, good question. How to explain a hotspot versus a mid-Atlantic rift from Renate. And some of these I might... Um, I will do some more Q&A video sessions when I can give these a little more proper treatment when I have more time to um, digest them and maybe prepare some graphics for you guys. In short, a the Mid-Atlantic Rift is a place where the plates are spreading apart. Um, the plates are pulling apart and the reduction of pressure as the plates move apart causes melting to occur in a layer deeper down in the mantle called the asthenosphere. And that's why we get volcanoes that rise along the mid-Atlantic rift. So most volcanoes on planet Earth are along plate boundaries that are either divergent or where one plate dives beneath another. That's what we call a subduction zone. Um, but then there are hot spots, and hot spots are completely unrelated to plate tectonics. They're just anomalous regions where there is what well, we think plumes of magma rising from deep within the mantle that penetrate the earth's crust and create uh, volcanoes like in Yellowstone or in Hawaii. So um, hopefully that helps a little bit. That's a quick, a quick um, one. Let's see, Charlie, do you know much about Appalachian geology? No, <laughs> um, just, Probably just the basics, fold and thrust belts, collision with uh, Africa uh, to form Pangaea. So you can see all these lovely um, lines that go through the Appalachians. Oh, let's take the roads off. There we go. And let's take the labels off. So a lot of this is folded rock, layers of sediment rock that have been folded. In places, the rocks are metamorphosed. So there's really cool structures here. Uh, I don't know much more. Uh, beyond that though so would love to learn um can magma behave like a oh this is the same person colloidal thixotropic gel where viscosity and propensity to behave like a solid or liquid is dependent on pressure yes pressure does dictate i don't know some of the big words there um but it does dictate the behavior of the magma uh if that's what you're asking that's a, that was a good one. I'm going to have to look up some of those words. I've heard thixotropic. I just can't remember what it means off the top of my head. Um, yeah, Nick and I, this isn't a question, but Brian, Nick and I have some uh, common, we're, we're sort of similar. We both have master's degrees. He went to Idaho State University, which is near me. I didn't go to school in Idaho, but I'm here now. Uh, so we do have some overlap. I think we have some similar opinions on science and how it's portrayed as well uh let's see let's see a couple more let's take a couple more minutes i'll look for a couple more questions some of you have to buzz out and that's fine so uh thanks for being here as long as you can uh scrolling scrolling could a very large quake this is from in surreal time could a very large quake open the earth dam and flood imperial valley with ocean water um not likely um yeah very large a quake it's not hmm, a really good question first of all it's a long way to get the water from here to there um i don't know what the distance is but it's it's not trivial um I don't. I just don't see, see an earthquake shaking. the The sand would settle. You might have this earthen natural dam, if we want to call it that, might sink a little bit. Um, but you'd probably need. I mean, the the process is really already happening on its own, um, as because this area of the salt and sea, and I have a video coming up that'll explain this a little bit better, is sinking. This is a divergent oblique boundary. So it's moving sideways like a, a strike slip fault, the San Andreas, but it's also opening up. If you come down here to the Gulf of California, 
Uh, you can't see much here because it's all there's so much sediment covering the seafloor. It's hard to see what's going on, excuse me. But if you come down here, you can nicely see there's a good one. Um the the long lines here are the transform plate boundaries. Oh, here's a good one. But then these shorter segments like this are the divergent plate boundaries. So this is this side is spreading to the northwest while this one goes to the, the southeast. Um, and then now if you imagine one of those, and I have a video coming up that'll explain this better, bring it up into this area. That's why we have some volcanoes in here. I, I just went to Obsidian Butte, did a video there and explained why we have, there's five vo young volcanoes pretty much aligned right along the south edge of the Salton Sea. And you have all that geothermal energy. Um, so it's going to, this area is going to sink lower and lower long-term anyway on its own long-term you know like thousands and you know, hundreds of thousands of years from now so um hopefully that helps a little bit good question um yeah michael i i kind of answered that question about the next eruption in the cascades i would guess it was probably saint helens could be south sister could be another one let's see um okay is the overall volcanic influence, let's see, in the overall volcanic influence is the Reykjanes Ridge and the North Atlantic connected to Iceland's volcanic geology. Okay, so zipping back across, we're just kind of going from Western US to Iceland area. So they are asking, uh, I believe, about this. So this is the plate boundary. This is the Reykjanes Ridge. There's a big transform fault here. So here's the, the divergent boundary here uh, spreading. Uh, and then it's offset here, and then you can see it more or less coming up this way, and then it takes more or less a beeline right into the ridge there. So the question is, is the ridge in the North Atlantic connected to Iceland's volcanic geology? It is in the sense that that's the plate boundary. So the plate boundary is shared. It's both in Iceland and it's in the North Atlantic. Um, but if we have a volcanic eruption here underwater, it doesn't influence Iceland. Remember that long fault systems, whether they're plate boundaries or not, are often segmented into, you know, uh, I don't know, they can be as long as maybe 50 kilometers, you know, 32 miles or something like that long. And then there's another segment. So when it has a fault or excuse me, an earth earthquake, it doesn't rupture the whole thing. It ruptures in segments as it goes. So um, good question there. Yeah, there's been a lot, and there was a little cluster a week or so ago of like a bunch of magnitude five earthquakes down here. Um, Jack Belk, my friend in Oakley, is asking about that. It's unconnected. It's a different segment. Um, it, could it be influencing the stress over here in Iceland at the southwest end? Possibly, but you're not going to have a bunch of magnitude fives way down here, you know, a thousand kilometers away that suddenly migrate up the plate boundary onto Iceland and generate a volcanic eruption. It's not going to be some, some chain reaction type of event like that. Good question though. I think um, you guys are asking really good ones. Um, let's see. Looking for some other questions here. Yeah, we'll go a couple more minutes. Um, Will Bradley, what about Newberry Crater exploding? Um, you know, before anything erupts in the Pacific Northwest or any other place, just like we're seeing in Iceland, we're going to have precursor events, right? We're going to have something's going to happen. You're not going to go from a nice sunny day in Oregon to holy cow, Crater Lake just erupted or Newberry, which is located um, just south of Bend in this area here. Yeah, here we go. So, you know, before we get to an eruptive event here, I would need to see lots of earthquakes, just like we saw in Iceland. I would need to see ground deformation. I might want to see gas emissions. And that would all need to ramp up over a series of weeks um, before we might see something. So is it possible that there's an eruption here? Sure. Would it catch us off guard? Doubtful. Um, uh, what do you think... Let's see. Questions. And if I'm missing yours, I apologize. It's, there's a lot here to scroll through. The Salton Sea is so weird, says Elaine. 
yeah, but it's so cool. The Salton Trough has like awesome, awesome geology. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, Brian says, I live in southeastern Arizona and the mountains and geology around here are fascinating. Metamorphic core complexes, limestone caves, and extinct volcanoes. Yes, um, so many good places to go. So he's down here in this region and there is exceptional geology down in southeastern Arizona. Mount Lemmon, there's the Chiricahua area, so much. Um, Krogatho is in the, in the Netherlands, there's an extinct volcano buried under two kilometers of sediment. Is it possible for an extinct volcano to start showing signs of unrest? That's a good question. I know I say that every time. <laughs> um, well, I wouldn't say it was a bad question. So the way we label volcanoes is interesting. We tend to use the words active, dormant, and extinct. Um, and you could argue that's not a good way to... Putting labels on anything is bad, but putting labels on volcanoes might not be a good idea either. Um, and But we do have some parameters for those definitions. So active to a geologist means it, it has erupted or shown signs of activity within the last 2000 years, which for a lot of people is like, seriously? So for example, um, I live here in Southern Idaho and this big black amoeba thing, this is the craters of the moon volcanic field. Um, this has not erupted in 2000 years. So imagine all the things that have happened with humanity in the last 2000 years. And this has done nothing during that period of time. And yet we consider it as geologists to be an active volcanic system. We expect it to erupt again. It's not showing any earthquakes. It's not showing any of the signs we've talked about, but we expect that it uh, will erupt at some time in the future. Then there's volcanoes that are considered dormant, meaning that they're you know, lying in wait. They haven't erupted in the last 2000 years, but maybe they erupted within the last, you know, 10 or 20,000 years, and they show some signs of activity. So what's a good example of a dormant volcano? Um, I don't know, maybe maybe like Mount Adams over here. I don't know its eruptive history, but hasn't done much in, in, in a while, but um, could potentially erupt again. Its neighbor to the west takes all the action, Mount St. Helens. And then there's extinct volcanoes where we consider them to be over and done with completely um, no longer. So it sounds like with your your volcano in the Netherlands, if it's extinct, I wouldn't expect it to erupt anytime. Um, but can an ex but can we change classifications, right? Can a dormant volcano become active? Can an extinct volcano become active or potentially active? Sure. Um, so remember, they're just labels, um, and labels can change. Um, let's see, toughen up fluffy. Do you think the Idaho batholithic complex was an island continent that accreted? Um, I haven't dove deep enough into that stuff to really know for sure. I've read some of that stuff. I followed some of Nick's videos, um, but not, not enough. I haven't read the papers and dove into that enough to make a, a good educated, um, statement on that. Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. So, um, your thoughts on the Baja BC? Okay, in clockwise rotation. Yeah, I don't, I have not put my head down that rabbit hole enough, even though I did research um, in my master's degree down here uh, near Loreto on structures in Baja. Uh, they're very young. They're related to the Gulf of California opening. They have nothing to do with the Baja BC hypothesis, even though my advisor, the late Paul Umhofer, uh, did a lot of research on that. Um, I just don't have enough knowledge in my head to really to know. So sorry for that. Um, can a quake cause liqu liquefaction of soil, rock, ground saturated with water, but on a large scale causing solids to flow below the surface? I don't know. I don't know, CZ, solids to flow. Liquefaction in its traditional manner with earthquakes has to do with water saturated sediments or soils um, losing their cohesive properties um, and becoming more like liquids uh, and then when the shaking stops they sort of re-solidify and there's some good there's some good evidence for those or a good video i think i've seen some videos of those like in new zealand and such okay let's see awesome hazel thank you for that 
she discovered my channel. She's 80 and housebound and she, I've opened a new world to her. That's, that's priceless. Thank you so much. Um, Skagit Ed, hello. Is the soil in the Salton Sea area considered a liquefaction zone? I would think so because they have a very, any place where you have an earthquake risk, which they do, and you have a high water table in sediments, which generally they do, you would have liquefaction potential. I haven't looked at hazard maps in California. I'm sure their state geological survey has done some studies there. I'm sure that there's plenty of published stuff you could look at, but I don't know for sure, but it makes sense that liquefaction potential in this area is high. I know for a fact though, it also exists because I have seen that data in the Salt Lake region, particularly in some of the lower elevation places near both the Great Salt Lake and Utah Lake. And so salt and seas in a similar situation overall. And so I would expect it to be uh, in a, a high liquef high risk li liquefaction zone. Um, okay, let's see. Couple more. If I missed, if I missed you, you guys. I apologize. Yeah, the more if you can hit the like button, that does help the YouTube algorithm. So I don't I don't know what magic happens, but clicking that thing is always awesome. Um, Teza says, hi, I'm an old Aussie, can't travel, but got interested in Nick's video. So now a Zen nerd. So all geology is interesting. Awesome. Yeah, however you got here, um, I appreciate it. So that's great. And let's see. Shout out to Paul. Yep. I miss him. He was a great guy. Went to his memorial in Flagstaff a little over a year ago. Where did the Colorado River enter the sea before the opening of Baja, California? Okay. Um, huh. Good, good one. So the Colorado River, let's take out the, yeah, a little hard to see because there's so, but here's the Colorado River coming down right along the California Arizona border. The Colorado River over time prehistorically has flowed all over this region. So at some times in its past, the Colorado River has flown, flowed, sorry, flowed into the Salton Trough. And when it did so, it created a huge freshwater lake called Lake Cahuilla. It's spelled C-A-H-U-I-L-L-A. -L -L -A. So we have shorelines here, just like we do for Lake Bonneville in the Great Salt Lake area. Um, we have tufa deposits like travertine deposits along the shoreline um there's great evidence for this big lake that existed here but occasionally what would happen is the the river and this is just basically a delta right would shift so it's depositing sediment in some places so it's flowing in a different place and then it would build up sediment shift its course its fluctuations would change dramatically with flooding events so sometimes the colorado river flowed into the salton trough and basically formed a huge freshwater lake. Other times it would flow to the south and enter the Gulf of California. Um, and so by shifting its course over time, it would it would it would build up this sediment in between. Um, yeah, and I, I don't know if I I did some videos down there. I don't know if I got deep into that story. That's almost like a good kind of presentation lecture story. Um, Really good question. So toughen up fluffy. That was, yeah, I like that topic. Very good. Um, thank you for taking along on our sabbatical trips. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, it's fun to learn together and it's fun just to kind of take the things I'm learning and, and share it with people and think out loud a little bit. Some of you, I know like the random uh, road cuts. I'll, I've got a couple more of those that I'll get out there as well. Um, so we'll look for those. Is there a geographic reason to prefer one Laguna Salada to Salt and Sea proposal over others? I um, don't think I know about that topic. Clicking the like tells YouTube that people are engaged in your video, not just watching, which increases the probability. Yeah, so if you want to help grow this channel and bring in more people to our little family and community, always pushing like on all my videos or any geology video will, will help with that. So... Uh, is there any reason why Hecla in Iceland doesn't give much warning with, before an eruption from uh, Steffi? I don't know. So I love Iceland and I read a lot about Iceland uh, in the literature I have. 
but I don't know a whole lot about some of the other volcanoes or areas in Iceland. And so I'm going to profess absolute ignorance on that topic and, and, but promise to read up on it. I don't know the eruptive history of Hecla. Um, it could be too, though, remember that we, we've got a, 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 you know, we've got a lot of volcanoes in Iceland. They are now in the last, I don't know, I don't know how long Iceland's monitoring system has been in place. So if we're looking at an eruption from the early 1900s, it might appear as if it didn't have any warning signs, but if it's in a fairly rural uninhabited area and we don't have the right instruments nearby, it can look like it happens without warning when in fact it probably did show earthquakes and ground deformation. I mean, think about how new GPS is, right? We're only looking at 30, maybe 40 years of actually having GPS around modern seismometers are maybe only 60 years old, 70 years old, something like that. So um, yeah, Hecla, I'll have to look up at its uh, volcanic history a little bit more. Um, yeah, and for subscribing too on the channel, not to make this all weird, but if you I did. I learned something new that if you um, put your if because I subscribe to some channels and there's that little bell icon, but if you click it so it's filled in and it's black, then you get notifications when a video gets pushed or there's a live stream or something like that. So um, make sure you've done that. Shauna wants to know, how are massive granite boulders formed? So those form by how the granite weathers. It develops fractures, cracks that are usually vertical and horizontal. So now imagine that big body of granite weathering into a uh, rect rectangular or square block um, and then erosion can kind of round off the sides and then the other thing that allows granitic boulders to become rounded is uh, something called exfoliation or it's sometimes called unloading or pressure release so the magma forms underground uh, with a lot of pressure of the rocks around it so once it's exposed at the surface it actually exfoliates into concentric rounded sheets that break off. And so that's why you see a lot of rounded granite boulders like in Yosemite or in Joshua Tree or other places. So that that was the quick 30 second version of that. Um, okay, we'll go a little bit longer. How long have we been doing this? This has been fun. It's 1230, we started at 11. Yeah, let's do a little bit more. There's still a lot of you on here. So um, maybe you've, maybe you're taking a nap. I don't know. This might put some folks to sleep, but there's still people asking questions in the chat. So I'll, I'll, I'll stick it out a little bit longer. Um, Peggy. Oh, this is, this is actually not a stupid question, Peggy. Would a Yellowstone eruption be the end of America? Uh, no full stop. <laughs> so, uh, and what she's really meaning there is like a catastrophic explosive end of all days you know, the, the clickbaity stuff that you hear about, right? I, I don't know why the Yellowstone thing gets so overhyped. Um, the chances of a big catastrophic explosive eruption at Yellowstone during your lifetime or your kids or your grandkids' lifetime is super, super low. You're much more likely to die by any number of other factors on planet Earth. Cancer, car crash, airplane crash, um, you trip over some ice and hit your head. I mean, there's all sorts of things that can get you before you get to uh, Yellowstone. And even if we had a huge Yellowstone eruption, I live right here in uh, Twin Falls, Idaho. So I'm, you know, not that far away, right? Just a state away. I'm, I'm fine. Like there would be a lot of ash that would get carried by the wind, uh, probably across Wyoming and into the Plain States. It could impact agricultural farming communities it could put enough ash into the atmosphere that the climate could cool and change a little bit but does it mean a mass extinction event absolutely not so yeah of all the things to worry about uh taking you out put yellowstone way down the list so hopefully i just set your mind at ease a little bit um the modoc episode was neat more like it um yeah if i get back over there i kind of hit some highlights while I was there, Dave, and um, the, oh, history and geology. Yeah, I do have another fun history and geology um, video c combination thing coming up 
um, I, n down near Blythe, down in the Salt or uh, Lower Colorado River Desert. I, I there's something down there that you guys might like. Uh, you need to watch a video when you subscribe, or the YouTube unsubscribe you from the channel. So, yeah, I don't know how the whole YouTube world works. I'm just I'm just here to share geology. So I'm trying to figure it out as I go. Um, okay, a couple more. There's probably more here than I can get to. So I apologize. Um, yeah. Um, what's your favorite, Charlie? What's your favorite or most interesting geologic area in the world? Oh, boy. Um, well, right now, I'm very passionate about Iceland. And that's why I think I go there regularly. And that's why I'm kind of fixated on that that landscape. It just really just kind of captivates and resonates with me. Um, there's places I'd like to go that just are interesting to me, like New Zealand, Chile. Um, there's all sorts of places I'd like to get to. Favorite places to go back to, though? Hmm. It's a hard question. Any place where there's volcanoes, I'm pretty stoked. Any place where there's structures, faults, folds, mountains, I'm pretty excited. Um, if it's, but I kind of can get excited about anything. I'm excited with fossils. I'm excited looking at s sequences of sedimentary rocks in Southern Utah, looking at canyons that get carved. Um, I'm pretty much fine with anything, I guess. So yeah, I have not visited West Germany, uh, slate granite sites. Um, I'll, I'll put this out to my European friends real quick. This is here's here's something that uh, you can help me with. Um, I'm not a big city traveler. I like to go to landscapes. But this coming March, my wife and I and a couple of friends will be traveling. We found a good little travel package thing, whatever. They, they did all this. I'm just along for the ride. I'm going to be a happy travel buddy. But we are going to Vienna and Prague. We have like three days in Vienna and three days in Prague. Um, it would be cool from what I've looked at, and I haven't looked at it in much detail, but from what I've looked at so far, there is not a lot of rocks in that area. But if I'm missing something, if there's a cool road cut in a little village nearby or in these cities or something I could make a video of in Vienna or Prague or very close to those towns, uh, let me know. And that would be great. Just shoot me some information and I would uh, appreciate that. Okay, let's see. Um, let's do two more questions and then we'll call it good. And I appreciate you sticking in for so long. This is really, um, it's really awesome. Have you been to the Rio Grande Rift Volcanoes in New Mexico? Ask Eddie. Um, no, <laughs> that's the short answer. I've been all over the West. We lived in Clovis, New Mexico when I was a little kid. Obviously don't remember that. Um, and I've been to Northwest New Mexico around Shiprock and Farmington. And I think I've been to Gallup in Window Rock. So just this little sliver of New Mexico. And then once upon a time when I was a kid, um, my dad was stationed out at the Air Force Base out here. We were at Clovis. So I have not visited any of the awesome volcanoes or cool geology right through the central New Mexico, Rio Grande area, but I'd like to. Um, very cool. The San Juans, yes, I have visited those. Shauna, I wanna to come to Australia so bad. I know you've probably seen my Midnight Oil t-shirt. That's my favorite band. I should have went when they did their last concert a year or so ago. Um, if you can hook me up with some places to stay or whatever, but Australia and New Zealand have been on my list for a long time. I think what we're waiting to do, to be quite honest, um, we still have, and not to be super personal, but uh, we still have two kids at home. And so if I go to a place like Australia or New Zealand, like I'm gonna be gone like a month and they wouldn't really wanna go and well, I don't think they'd want to go. So it would probably just be my wife and I. And so to be gone that long, we probably need to wait a couple more years until they're, um, until we're empty nested, until we don't have uh, kids to 
um, be responsible for it at home. So probably look for that. My youngest is a freshman right now. So we've got what, like three and a half more years. Uh, and then I would love to do a trip to either Australia and or New Zealand. So awesome. Well, I think that's it. I've never visited Indonesia. Minadil does rock. I'm just quickly looking at a couple of these. And I think that's good. I'm going to go grab some lunch. My I'm a little parched from all the talking. But this was great, team. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I love doing these live streams with you. Um, any tips you have on things to improve upon, that would be great. I'm going to figure out OBS Studio and use that next time. Um, look for me with Nick, I guess, in February. I will, of course, keep you updated with things happening in Iceland as, the, as that situation develops, if it does. I will continue to post videos for you to enjoy. I appreciate your viewership. I know there's a lot of stuff on YouTube you could be looking at. So the fact that you want to spend time learning geology with me uh, is humbling, it's flattering, and it makes me really happy. So uh, until next time, have a great holiday season. We'll see you out there in the various places. Hopefully I can see some of you in person on some of these field trips that are coming up. Um, yeah, we'll just, we'll, we'll stay in touch. Thanks for building this fun little community and thanks for spending time with me today. Have a great day and take care. Cheers.